Hello everyone and welcome to the Game Engine programming series where we write a game engine from scratch. In the last episode we added a camera to the rendering engine and although the code for doing that wasn't particularly challenging to write, we did cover a lot of view and transform related mathematics. Now that we have that behind us, we can resume coding away full speed and today I'd like to start exploring what we need to do in order to tell the renderer how it should render any game entity that has a geometry component. First, let's correct a couple of typos from the previous episode. Here we are using the direction towards which the camera is looking, so we need to use XM matrix look to instead of look at. Also, I somehow called the wrong function here, which should be one that calculates the orthographic projection. In this orthographic camera helper structure, I made a copy paste typo. This should be orthographic. Now, when I build the release configuration, we get all these warnings about unused function parameters. This is because the only place we refer to this parameter is the assert function call, which is obviously not compiled during a release build. So to get rid of these warnings, I'll decorate the size parameter with an attribute which lets the compiler know that it's okay for this parameter to be unused. In the last episode I also changed some of the include file paths, and because I didn't check if they are working for all build configurations, we ended up with errors when we try building the engine with one of the editor configurations. So I'm correcting this mistake here. That's all for fixes. As I mentioned in the intro of this video, we need to figure out what more we need to do in order to render any geometry. Right now we are successfully uploading our mesh data to the GPU, but that's not enough to render the mesh. So first I'd like to explain my plan for the steps that we need to take for rendering objects. We already made a data structure that we can use to construct a hierarchy of submeshes. This is the geometry hierarchy, which consists of at least one level of detail, or LOD, and each LOD has at least one submesh. In context of rendering, we refer to this hierarchy as a geometry. Rendering a submesh is the job of the low level renderer. When rendering a submesh, we might use textures for different surface properties of the object. Use of textures is optional, since we can also use a constant color or some procedurally generated coloring scheme to render a submesh. However, most submeshes in a typical game do use textures in general. In addition to textures, we need to write little programs that run on the GPU, which we call shaders. In order to render a submesh, we need at least two shaders, a vertex shader and a pixel shader. In the future, we might also want to support mesh shaders. In that case, we need a mesh shader and a pixel shader. The shaders will use the mesh data and the textures to output the final pixel color on screen. The collection of shaders and textures define a material which is used to render a submesh. In Primal Engine, we refer to this combination of a submesh and a material as a render item. At a low level, one submesh is used with one material, and the job of the low level renderer is to take a list of such render items and render it as quickly as possible. At a higher level, we can associate a list of materials with a list of submeshes in a geometry hierarchy. This is the high level render item. We can define multiple render items that use the same geometry with a different list of materials. In this episode, we are going to work on high level render items and compiling and organizing shaders so that they can be used in a material. We are going to work on the low level render items and materials in the next episode. Since textures are optional, I'll postpone importing and using textures to a later episode. Before we continue, I'd like to organize our data here in the test application a little bit so it will be easier to keep track of them. 
Since we attach the camera to this entity, I'll group them together. Next, I'd like to have a function that creates a render item and another one that destroys it. I must emphasize that these functions are part of the test application and are not going to be included in the game engine. Remember that we also wrote a function that creates one game entity for us? So these functions are at the same level. When initializing the application, we create a render item, which will return an ID. When shutting down, we use that ID to destroy the render item. Now let's add a new file for the implementation of these functions. I'll call it renderitem.cpp. Let me first write down what we need to do to create a render item. First, we need to have a geometry asset loaded and ready. Then we need one material for each of the submeshes within that geometry. Of course, we can refer to the same material multiple times. So even for a geometry with multiple submeshes, we can get away with defining just one material. The fact that we don't have textures doesn't matter because they are optional, but we do need to load shaders. And finally, we need to add a function in the engine that will take this information and create a render item from that. To destroy a render item, we remove it from the engine first. Here in the test application, we also remove the game entity that owns the geometry. Next, we remove the shaders and textures and finally the model. Again, this is just to clean up the resources that were created in this test application. In reality, we don't have to remove materials when we destroy a render item, as they can be in use or be reused by another render item. Okay, let's write a function that loads our geometry and another one that will load the shaders. We run these functions on two different threads, because why not? We wait till the threads exit, at which point we have our model and shaders loaded. Before creating a render item, let's write these two functions first. Loading the model file is really easy because we already have done it, so we can just copy and paste this code. I do need to include some headers and add a function declaration for the read file function. For the shaders, let's say we want to render our geometry using a vertex shader and a pixel shader. So we need to compile and load two shaders. Note that in a final game, the shaders are already compiled in bytecode and we only need to load them as a binary blob and pass them to the low-level renderer. However, we do need to compile them before shipping the game. Now let's have a look at our shader compilation. We already wrote some code that compiles and saves the built-in engine shaders. However, we can't directly call any function to compile a user-defined shader. So to that end, I'm going to restructure what we have here first. This shader file info contains engine shader ID, which shouldn't be here if you're going to use this structure for shaders other than engine shaders. Let's take this struct out and put it in the header where we can access it from other CPP files. 
I'll also move the shader type enumeration to here, so we can use it at a higher level. Now I'll create another local type, that's a combination of shader file info and the engine shader ID. This is to be used specifically for the built-in shaders. We need to change the shader data here to fit this new data format. I'll also rename the variable that's holding this data. Next, instead of returning a single blob that contains the compiled shader's bytecode, I'd like to return something that contains more information about the shader. In addition to the bytecode, I'd also like to have the disassembly and the hash code for the compiled shader. Later, we may even want to include debugging information, but for now, this is all we need. We can use the hash code to quickly determine if different shader sources result in the same bytecode. That way, we can include just one copy of the bytecode. The compile functions in shader compiler class will now return this new data structure. This means that we need to modify them and add new functionality that will get us the disassembly and the hash code. I also add another compiler option that turns on 16-bit integer support in shaders. This is because we need to unpack our vertices, which is easier if we could use 16-bit integers. And I'll tidy up things as we go through this code. At the end of this function, we call an overloaded function to do the actual compilation, so we need to update this function as well. In order to get the hash code, we can call get output with the XC out shader hash enumeration. This is by the way another example of a function that can return different types given an enumeration value, like we did for the camera interface functions. We also checked that the hash code computation didn't include shader's source code because we are only interested in comparing the bytecodes. The hash code is an array of bytes. The number of bytes is 16 for the current implementation of DirectX shader compiler. Let's convert each byte to a hexadecimal string and write it to the output panel. We already get the shader bytecode here, so this part doesn't need updating. For the disassembly, we call disassemble function giving it the bytecode. 
then we can get the output using DXC out disassembly enumeration. Finally, we put everything together in the return value. In order to be able to use some new features of Direct3D12, I'm going to use Shader Model 6.6. .6. This shader model is also supported by older graphics cards, as long as your graphics drivers and Windows installation are up to date. When saving the built-in shaders, we need to accept the new return type for compiled shaders. We are not going to save the disassembly for engine shaders. It's mainly intended to be used to inspect the generated code for material shaders in the editor, so we don't need it here. And we also use the same return type when compiling the engine shaders, again trying to tidy up the code as we go. Okay, great. Now we are ready to write a function that will compile any shader code that's written by the user. And that's exactly what we are going to do in the next video. I hope you enjoyed watching and as always, thank you so much for joining me today and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, please feel free to like and subscribe. If you join me on Patreon, you'll get access to the code on GitHub so you don't have to type everything over from the video. Plus there are also other nice goodies and rewards exclusive to my Patreon supporters. Please use the link in the video description to check them out. I hope to see you next time, until then take care and happy game engineering!